Hello and welcome. I'm the Restless Kaiser. And I'm Johnny B. But together we are... Modeling, Modeling for Advantage. Battlefront Gale Force 9 Boom. sent us a copy of Clash of Steel Operation Unthinkable Germans vs British Complete Starter Set. Why, thank you. Before we even get the cling film off, John, why don't you tell them what comes in the box? Okay, here we go. Take a deep breath. 17 highly detailed plastic model tanks, 22 tank commanders, decals for them, uh, complete rule book, quick start rules, 20 dice, 2 force booklets, 19 unit cards, 34 tokens, 3 objective markers, 2 victory point dials, that's going to come in handy, now, interestingly, 26 tactics cards, 6 mission setup cards, 9 mission rule cards, and 22 objective cards. And they're the bits that I'm most interested in. That's, that's the new bit, The right? new tanks are exciting. Yes, for sure. But when I say new tanks, the German tanks are not actually that new. But let's get it open yeah. and, and, show them what, and show them what there is. So the German stuff in here has been out for a little bit. There's um, In all counts. In all counts, because the mouse came out for World of Tanks, the miniatures game, and that was before Christmas. Yes. So many people will have one in their collection. This is one of two starter sets they are doing for Clash of Steel. This is Operation Unthinkable, German versus British. Operation Unthinkable was the real deal, you know. Was that an actual operation? Yeah, Churchill turns around to Alan Brooke and the joint, you know, the um, British War Cabinet or whatever, and says, "Right, go away and and tell me if we have to fight the Soviets like after, next oh. week." Can we do it? And they come back and they say, no. <laughs> wow. So be on your best behaviour. And the code name for that, that planning was document was unthinkable. Operation Unthinkable. What would happen if... So while John gets this open, this is that kind of, what if World War II ended a little bit differently? Mm. That the Americans and the Soviets are still at war makes sense to me in a, in a, in a kind of... Uh, well, they're just as bad as, as the Nazis in a different kind of way. Yes. And there were people like Patton thought that. But the Germans, I'm not... Is this that the war has gone on? And the... and the uh, Or of the Germans... Is it that kind of black alliance that the, that the, the Nazis have joined forces with somebody to fight the Soviets? as a true enemy and we'll need to see the book for that all right so we'll okay. as, as you unpack them then the things so there's tigers. some tigers all right some koenig's tigers koenig's tigers two of them four of the centurions that's a fairly new kit yeah uh yeah all right we're going to give you more detail on these uh tortoise tortoise times two. Oh, i thought there was only one in here no two two get two um that one the Panzer IV L70, of which there are one. three. The mouse, which is, is very nice. Mouse. It is a big tank, the mouse. And then the other one. The Comet. The Comet. Which is a kind of a redesigned Cromwell at the end, towards the end of the war. All right? Yep. Um, and then the other components, though, are some spare pieces. Oh, some bits that fell out. Other components. There's your tank commanders. Let's put them back in there so we don't lose them. Yeah. Uh, tank commanders, tank commanders. Presumably they are the normal World War II uh, tank commanders through. Get your wonderful dice. It's nice yes. of them. Black and red, like you're getting hit the beach in various other sets. These must be little plastic pips for the turn mm, dials. We'll have a look at those. And then a whole bunch. That's good. It's and it's shrink wrapped. A lot of it to stop it from getting damaged. Decals. Hmm. Germans, Soviet stars, and Allied. Oh, it's a combined Scott decal sheet. Doofer. Yeah, Balkan crosses, Soviet red stars, and then a range of white allied stars. Interesting. Operation Unthinkable, says the bit of paper. Uh, the end of the deadliest conflicts in human history. The world was ready for peace. But no. Once again, tanks rumble across the fields on Europe. Boo. All right, let's have a look at all the paper then, shall we, John, before we talk about the tanks. Paper bits. Paper bits. So I'm actually going to move that out of the way. So we've got a bit more table space. Core rules. Nice. Mm. So that's like a, a, an introductory play sheet. Truly. To get you going. Yeah. And yeah. step opponent's turn. Wonderful. Nice. There's L rule book. L rule book. Okay. Yeah. I will have a flick through this in a moment. German forces of the Operation Unthinkable. Interesting. That looks quite. Oh! A bit more complex. And then there's the British. 
Uh, rules quick reference sheet on the back there. That's nice. Yeah. So so this is like a codex. Oh wow. This is in, in pamphlet form. This is a codex, right down to telling you so you make your camp grouper and which different platoons you can have in it. And then individual unit breakdowns. So there are stats in here for mouse, tiger two, tiger one, panther, and the uh, 88 millimeter armed uh, panther that I think was designed but never built. Uh, Yag tiger, humor. Hornis, Yag Panther, Panzer 470. Interesting. That's nice. It is nice. And they've also, for this game, I know that they're repackaging these tanks so they come in this kind of size. It yeah, regards unit, sizes. unit sizes. Okay, yes. cool. Yes, cool, yeah, cool, cool. sorry, they're not rescaling. Yeah, I was like, wow. No, no, no. Interesting. And the, the British one's the same. Yeah, yeah. Looks and to there's, be. A, there's a bit of history. We're going to have a read because you just saw us open this for the first time. I'm going to yeah, have a bit sorry. of a read of this stuff you know, at some point in transition, and we'll sort of explain uh, the story stuff a little bit later. Nice. Well, yes, they're there. But we're still going through the components, right? It's nice that they've got these codex in, though, because this is most of the late, the very late war stuff, mm. and it's their newer, better kits. Uh, assembly guides for both. Oh, it's so nice. A couple of Centurion 1, Centurion 3. So Tortoise. What I like about this is that it seems like the whole thing is designed to be able to give the other half to your mate. You give him his own booklet, yep. you give him his own instructions. You don't have to pull any pages out or chop anything up. You can just pass the bits relevant to the other player. So if you move. bought in, split the kit, Good move. you've got that. Now, here we get the proprietary bits for the game. Yes. So these seem to be trackers and all the other bits that we said about. Very nice thick card. Very Victory nice point card tokens. Stack. Victory. Ah. Oh, double-sided. Double-sided. So these are your uh, bailed-out markers. Because it's bailed out on the back. Bailed destroyed out destroyed. or bailed out markers. But then, because this has got a proprietary mission system for procedurally generating your missions, which is what all these other cards are for, you need things like these score trackers. Yeah. So we'll have, again, when we get to it, we'll have a bit of an assemble of those <laughs> and explain it to you. And it comes in a lovely tray. This is this is good. It keeps all the cards nice and safe. Uh, that is the unit cards. Unit cards. Now, do you get... You get unit cards for tanks that you haven't got in here. Great. Archer. Oh, so yes, that seems to be. Yes, very I much think you're getting a unit card. So if you're an existing Flames of War yeah. Team Yankee player and you've got them, so this has got Churchill 7 in it, Centurion 1 or 3, Comet and Tortoise is in here, but Challenge is not in here, Cromwell's not in here. And Archer is not in here, but they've given you cards. And they're all in that force booklet. And they're all in that force booklet. They go in the force diagram. And that's really good, because often with their kind of starter armies and things, mm. they give you the card. Because there's a lot of cards in for the World War II options. Yes. But this is much more limited, so they're giving you them. Which means, yeah, all of those German vehicles that I mentioned earlier... Are there. The cards are all here. I think, that's, I think that's really good. That is yeah, good. Because you, you don't need to buy any cards. No, you can just add, as you say, your collection in there. Yeah, uh, in. These are the mission setup cards mm. and everything. With, uh, yeah, rules on the back there. Well, again, I think we'll look at them in a little yeah. bit more detail. Uh, a separately. bit later. I think, yeah. Well, I've had a bit of a read of the booklets. So if we start with the paper and then the cards and things, and yeah. we'll move on to the tanks later. Because some of the people will already know all about the tanks. As in, yeah. we've seen a lot, a lot of kits of them before. About. Right? So, interestingly, the story for this, which is what threw me with this set, I thought I understood what the story was, and then I saw this set was German versus German British. Mm. Right. So, this, their kind of science fiction post World War II starts in 1944. It assumes that the Stauffenberg plot, the assassination of Hitler, you know, with the briefcase under oh, the table, yep. the Tom Cruise Tom movie. Tom Cruise, yep. Yeah, All right. That, that was successful. Okay. And that leads to Germany, the, uh, the, the army, if all oh, but staging a coup, denazifying the country and suing for peace. They sue for peace and then war breaks out later. And actually, as you can see from this picture on here, that means that the German forces, these German forces, you see this German corps, yes. is on the Allied side fighting the Soviets. Okay. It's different. 
Now, that doesn't mean you're not necessarily playing the bit before peace was surrendered. Right. Uh, uh, peace, bit... peace was agreed. And what's good about this is it's actually slightly different in the different booklets. So you get this, you get this, so you get the German, German forces, forces at war, at war section, war. the British forces at war section. Right. So it's personalised to the particular force. So the, this, you know, four pages, So there's four pages of text here that they have they have written up the story of what's happening here, um, but yeah. So and, and it's it's a fancy war game. You can play British forces against American forces if you like. There's nothing yeah, stops you doing true, that. True. Um, but in their actual story, the Germans have been rearmed and are fighting the Soviets alongside the Allies. Um, so that was that was the stuff in there. There was one other thing in. Was it in here or was it in the main book? It was in the main book, so I'll come to it later. Right. It's the main rule book for anyone that wasn't sure. This game is basically Flames of War without infantry and artillery. Okay. That doesn't mean That's good. that one, but that massively speeds up the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, it does still have, have self-propelled guns. It does have procedurally generated missions, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. And the the couple of things from the main rule book, there's some slightly different language because it's tanks only. So it talks about being camouflaged. Right. Whereas in Flames of War, you had gone to ground, but it's effectively the same rule. Okay, camouflage yeah. gone to ground for tanks. Yeah, <laughs> it camouflage. If it doesn't move, it you in flames or it was gone to ground. In this, it's, it's camouflage, but it has the same in-game effect. Yeah, which is that if you're in cover, it makes and you've gone and you camouflage again. Stacking modifiers. Yeah. You're stacking modifiers, but it's only of value if you didn't move. All right, if you're also in cover. Sorry. Well, then I'm never gonna ever get you're that never ability, am I? And then also in this rules, as well as the um, uh, mission generator, is there's also commander abilities. So you know you always have that thing about, oh, my force is 97 points or whatever. Yes. In every point space system. Well, in here, for between one and five points are commander abilities. A one point ability is improve your cross check by one. That's not a big deal. A five point ability is increase the anti-tank rating of your commander's tank by two. Now in a game where you're often like on the dice when the big tanks shoot at each other, mm. that's quite a big deal. Worth five points. On the right tank. On the right tank. <laughs> on the right tank. Um, but in the list we've seen here is the command tanks are the big ones. Mm. They're, they're the powerful ones. Um, so I like it because it's... Um, what I had hoped this game would be was better bridging between between sort of uh, tanks and flames of war. I think this is a better starter game because it's it's flames of war light. Like, it's tank only, making it quick. I can deal with that. Yeah, and your list building is interesting as well because it's not completely freeform. It's not pick whatever you want. No, there are lists still. Yes, so you have to build. You have to take a headquarters which in the examples we've got here is either one or two mouse, one or two tigers, or one or two panthers. But you have to have at least two core units then, um, which are your mouse and your tiger and your panther types, before you, you can only have up to two units of your scout type troops, which is interesting because it, it, it makes the choice less free and the game's perhaps a, a bit more predictable. They're not completely free form, which is the danger yeah. with a light game. Is like, I bring a load like of unarmored. Tanks, you've just got yeah, complete yeah. mishmash if Absolutely. you really want to. It's not tanks, it's not you bring anything you want. No. You are building a list from from a list. But it is a heavy tank platoon that you're yeah. going to be playing with. As you say, flames and light. Th yeah, flames light, absolutely. It's great. Just. So that's the paper. Right, so the tokens and the cards. This is the bit that's kind of really interesting about this. First thing to say, Spinny Widger. Yep. Uh, one attacker, one defender in orange and black, very modern colours. You'll notice the German Donner company uses these colours, so it must be right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fact. Love a German Donner. Love a German Donner. If you love a German Donner too, <laughs> let us know down in the comments. I wonder if that's if that's where it where it where Are the idea came from. Like <laughs> Oh, we, we are not sponsored, but would we love to be yeah. sponsored by the German Donner Company in, in Luton. 
Uh, well, uh, it's been due for for your um, victory point. Yeah, sorry, yeah, because victory points. You, you accumulate victory points. Tacker defender ones. Um, it's an easy sort of plug system. What's it called? Yeah. What would we call that? They're like poppers. They're almost poppers, like coat yeah. studs. There's a male and a female part. Yeah, you push it through the cardboard. It's really not difficult. Boom. The only thing I would suggest though is that it, pay attention to the lettering. There is an A and a B side, so you don't yeah. want to. Pop it in and I think back to put, front. Put them on the wrong, down. the wrong way around. I think you might come out upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but attack around defender because you are going to score as you go. Objective uh, markers. Objective markers. We need to talk about them again. They are numbered. The other tokens we had those command abilities. Yes, command abilities. You've got your camouflaged. You've got your destroyed and bailed out. Yes. Um, camouflage on here. Is what was the flame to flames of war gone to ground roll, which right. makes less sense, sense with a tank, but still yeah. gives you an option. So what they're saying in this game is, if your tank didn't move, then it has been camouflaged by its crew. Okay, but the way that the game works is camouflage is not a modifier to hit; it's only an additional modifier if you're also in cover. Oh, okay, so it's improved so cover for being stationary in cover. Right. Okay. And that's where the scout rule right. so it messes around with that. All right. Um, you have your gong tokens for your commanders and command abilities. Nice. Might sometimes need to put things down. And you've got some leader markers on here somewhere. Unit leader, if you needed to mark right. which one is the unit leader for some purpose. Now, you also get this. Yeah, it's that, that's cool. I mean, I don't know why. But there yeah. are lots of measurements and lots of distances in Flames of War. But this is four for inches. measuring... Ob uh, four inches is for objectives, and it's for blitz moves and things like that. So it, it does matter, I guess, a few times, and they've given you a measuring tool. I don't know why it's just because there was a bit of space on the cardboard that I mean, they had printed. It's um, a measurement I hold gear. What, four inches? <laughs> yeah. Indeed. But these cards, then... So right. Procedurally okay. generated missions. So what you do... Pick is a card, you start, any card. Pick a card, any card... With the big card, you work from big to small in this game, I think. Is that the way it goes? You get... What you got? Which one? A mission card. Okay. Well, the first thing for your mission card is you get a map. Uh, a map, yes? Yes. And it tells you deployments in just the same way as Flames of War did. This is where the attacker goes. This is where the defender goes. And then if you have to roll for reserves, then it's got the dice results. The measurements and everything else. The measurements. Well on there. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all in there, just like Flames of War mission. It also has got the instructions on the back and how you design, how you just go through the mission. Go setup. through the mission setup process, right? So you, that you get one of them. Boom. Okay. Boom. Mission there you go. Done. You Next. then have your unique mission rules. Now, anybody again who's played Flames of War Team Yankee will be familiar with all these mission rules, but it, this means they're in a different order. And you draw them. And you draw them. So you get to take these. Uh, they're called mission rules in here. I think they were called something slightly different yeah, in the rules, and it was confusing bit, yeah. when we were reading it. So well, we got mission rules one. So this one's very simple. Game length will be six rounds. Okay, boom. Okay, nice. So that's it. All right. Next. Let's have a next card was mission rules six. Uh, game length is six rounds and ambush. Before deployment, both players may hold one unit in ambush. See page forty nine. So they're, they're quite small mix ups, but you might have. Some of your forces as reserves, delayed reserves, and that's why you've got these dice written on the mission card. So it covers all of whatever you're going to draw. Is the, right. 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 Yeah, that's good. Right. So that in and of itself is like randomly generated missions. Great. But it's more than that, because we then have the objective cards. Which is this little deck. So you've got these, I think it, all it the ones one? we looked at, yeah, it's the teeny yeah. deck, yeah, because they sit on these cards. Your objective markers are numbered one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that really mixes up the game, because you will place one of these objective cards on the objective, and it is revealed on the turn number that's on the objective. So objective one, you will know what objective one is on turn one. Boom. You'll turn the card over and put it on, and what Size was it? location. Tanks must be within two inches. So this will see there. So to boom. claim this objective, you've got to be within two inches, not four inches of it. Yes. So yeah? it does change the dynamic. Okay, so on round two, two. we'll draw... It's demolition. Demolition. Something different. <laughs> so demolition... Is you have to make an? Do you have to make an? Oh, yeah. You have to make a cross check. Yeah, a cross check, and then it blows up, and you get five victory yeah, points. So you got to drive the tank through through it, but you get five victory points, and then you draw another card. 
So that's really that's good. That's really different because if you've done that with some kind of wheeled scout car, you've cl thought you claimed this objective and you get there and you're like, oh. I have the wrong tool for this job. <laughs> can't do it. Yeah, can't do it. And you won't know that until turn two. And then turn three, three. we'll draw the next one. Get the civilians out, mate. Evacuate civilians. Uh, In this instance. <laughs> if... Do you want to redraw? Target enemy <laughs> tanks within four inches of the objectives. Oh, see, you can't score this if you're shooting at someone that's within four inches of the objective. Civilians, man. Because there's people about. Yeah, absolutely. That's clever. Uh, but like with the demolition one, you would redraw as well. It would it would change. Keep going. So that I like that. I That's like gonna keep that the flow. a lot. Yeah, I like the fact that the objectives are not scorable. So you have to think about things at different phases of the game. Mm. The the battlefield requirements change, and you can partially plan for it, but not entirely plan for it. And then the last thing is the hand of tactics cards. Oh no! So oh, no. this is really tight in the in the, in the wedge. You, you get go. one out. Right. Okay. So you start with a hand of three. Right, yes. Each turn, you get an extra one, and you can discard as many as you want and redraw that many. All right? So, assuming you're playing one a turn, you're going to end the game with three cards. Mm. But you could have a smaller hand because you played more than one in a turn. These are good. They give you a title. They tell you when to play it, and they tell you what it does. Boom. So this one, stashed ammo in my own shooting step, re-roll one to hit result. I mean... Yeah, there you that's go. pretty concise and to the point. If I've got a clot shot to make, I can keep this card for the whole game. Or, if I'm the kind of player that I am, first shot of the game that I miss, ah! I, roll, I roll this card because I'm going to get more cards. Yeah. I don't want to mill the deck for the better ones. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, get, you have these cards, you get to use them. They mix it up. And what I like about what, what I think cards should do in a game is they should mix the game up, break the meta, break the kind of formulaic nature of the game. I think this, if they'd just been a set of mission cards, like 30 cards that had a map on and the rules on the back, yeah. I'd be less interested. They can also, these are cards, but they've got numbers on. These are presumably, there's, there's probably tables for them. Maybe it's in the book, maybe it's as a PDF. But, you know, if you didn't have the cards, you could still do it. I don't know whether they are in here like that, but... There's definitely numbers on there, though. But they could also release another pack of cards with another yeah, set of do. mission rolls. They could say for the for the desert, yeah, for the Pacific. Different things. They could give you. They could give you sort of. You know, maybe it's another ten cards that says that are slightly different. But maybe it says in in the Pacific you should use mission cards six, seven, thirteen, fifteen, and twenty four. Or, or, or whatever. Many options. There's some modularity yeah. with that down That's the line. Um, yeah, and because it's more of a more of a speedy. I mean, it's not a historical game. It's got mouse in it it's and in the future, mate. science fiction tanks um, and set in a in a, in a, in a make believe alt history mm. setting. And um, so I think the more gamey it is, the better. I think as a bridging game to get people into Flames of War as a, you know, like a convention Flames. game, a yeah. club game, you know, a, a game to get kids into historical gaming. I think there's a lot going for it. And it's not just that the basic mechanics of firing and fighting with Flames of War tanks is good. It's that these things keep what could become quite tired, quite fresh. Particularly if, like, you know, you bought this set and you wanted to play with it several times before committing, these mission cards mean that you will not play the same game even yeah. though you've got the same vehicles. And in some of them, you're going to feel like, I wanted some more light vehicles, and in others, you're going to feel you wanted some more heavy ones. Keeping it fresh. And keeping it fresh, yeah, really excited. Really, um, this is concluding thoughts. <laughs> So in summary, John, I think the bit that I was most excited about we did early on, I, I love the mission deck. I really love the tactics cards. I, ho I think modern games should have more things like that in them. Yep. And they need to not be too complicated. A lot of modern games yeah, do have cards much. and things in them, but they're quite overwhelming. They're not like you have three cards and they say, re-roll a missed hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Minus one <laughs> to being shot at. Flip the thing. You know, the, the, yeah. have another go at that. They often are quite complicated and wordy and needlessly so. Yeah. And have messy interactions or, or preconditions. These are not that. This is playing the shooting phase. 
re-roll a missed shot. As far as we know, the ones that we've seen. <laughs> the ones that we've seen. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. ones that we've seen. But, but they, yeah, maybe there's some that, that are harder to understand. All right, John, let's get on to the tanks then. That's what I think a lot of people want to talk about. Should we start with the British? Because um, there's some new stuff there. There is some new ones in that. Um, uh, it's not all brand new, but some of it is. So the Centurion one we've seen um, a bit back because it came out with the new World of Tanks. Right. Uh, we've actually day. we've actually got one. It's a big old tank. Here, it is a big old tank. I mean, it, it, so you're moving into the. You know, we talked before about sort of light, medium, and heavy tanks. Yes. And um, and and what's what's happening during the course of the Second World War is the the kind of medium tank is dominating, but me, but medium tanks are getting bigger. And so in that sort of towards, I don't quite know when the term comes in, but what we refer to as a main battle tank now is much heavier than most World War II heavy tanks. But in, in weight, but in role, is still a medium tank. It's still a... Right. Right? So that, that's modern a kind versus, of... Yeah, yeah, modern tank. Modern armour is medium tank in role in most cases, mm. um, but much bigger and much heavier. So this is a kind of immediate post-war British tank design because if you think about in world war ii we haven't actually had many good tank designs in britain cromwell churchill so cromwell would have been great in 1942 oh <laughs> come out a bit too late did it well it's got a 75 mil gun and it comes out in 1944 mm. Yeah, it's it's a medium tank, but it's still kind of a, a, a successor to the cruiser tank philosophy. But but speed and mobility is a big deal. But what you get in um, after that is is the Merlin engines. You get in aircraft engines. Remove the supercharger for takeoff and stick them in a tank. Yeah, that's what a meteor going. engine is. Don't know whether this thing's got a meteor engine, but I think it has. I think it's also got. But this is a thing that you know. It's supposed to pull along an aeroplane at incredible speed. It's got speeds. some torque, man. It's got yeah. some torque. Um, so the the chieftain is in service for a very, very long time. Um, and as I say, it came out as well. It was with the Team Yankee forces. The a lot of the Scandinavians were still had these things kicking around in the eighties and the nineties. I'm not sure if somebody even still has them. It had really? a, a number of variants. And what's really good about this sprue is it deals with that. And what's good about this rules card, wherever it's gone, is it's ignoring a really important feature of this. What, what's odd about that turret, John? Um, the gun. It's got a second gun on it. What is that? That's it's not a machine, machine gun. gun. That's a that's a, that's a Polston cannon. Oh my! Now. In a tank, in a, in a game of main battle tanks, what is that going to do? It's irrelevant, like machine guns. Which this is again the difference between it and Flames of War is it's stripping out things that are not important. Mm. And actually, it's only on the first generation of these tanks that they have these Polston cannons. Um, they ditch them, but a little bit, you know, people have ideas about what might be good in wars, and they're not always right. But they but can it, seem like really good ideas at the time. Okay. But when it hits the field... But when it hits the field, it, it, yeah, it in, the in field. terms of its functionality. So, everybody still has coaxial machine guns. So, they're obviously a good idea. And this is just a coaxial, really heavy machine gun. So, why wouldn't, yeah. why wouldn't that be better? Saying, well, for whatever reason, it isn't. Hmm. It probably requires another guy to operate is a big part of it. Yeah, bigger ammo. Um, bigger ammo, just putting out firepower that you just don't need. Mm. But I guess the thinking is, if you're firing at soft skins, at, at, at close and medium ranges, That's gonna you help. don't need to fire your main gun at them. Yeah, so back for the big boys. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the thinking is. But there was some thinking. But there was some thinking. It was put in. It's in the first generation of it. And the, the great thing is that this kit is flexible enough that it, that it can build it. It's also got on it a couple of different um, these different engine decks, which will be different eras of tanks. Unless that's you've got yeah, the Centurion one and the Centurion and the Centurion three. three. Yeah. Oh, I just shook the. Uh, oh no! Tear it off. Um, right. As a kit. Anyway. So 
very, very good uh, example of how Flames of War Battlefront make their tanks. So you, your, um, your road wheels, your running gear, and your tracks are all in a single piece. Really strong keying. The advantage of the, as these vehicles get bigger, mm. they're more and more able to do that. And you've got three keying points on one side and two on the other, so you, so you can't, can't put them on the up. wrong way around. Uh, the road wheels at the and the idler wheel will be at the right end, um, and it builds you a few different versions, which is great. Again, like most of their tanks, it assembles. You get your lower hull, you put your tracks on it, stick a piece in the back, and then a plate on the top. Don't forget your whopping great turret guns. Absolutely, and then and the number of different guns that are on here is because of the number of different versions. And then I think um, might be the Danes, but the ones that continue to use them well past their expected service life, they have their own local upgrades. Right, they have their own programs for that, um, which is also why we've got two different turrets, haven't we? Yeah, that's the, two the different differences. Upper, yeah, upper that seems to be the main sort of difference between the one. The main and the different three. and the engine deck piece. Yeah. Is different oh, yeah. between one and the <laughs> other. Quite, yeah. yeah, it's going to make it quite different. Got skirts, got all the bits. Uh, lovely kit. If you want to know more about this particular kit, Harry from Fog of War did a fantastic review of it. You get four of these in here. So it's very likely that you're going to use because I think they come in units of up to three. So you may well have one of them as your HQ and three of them as your battle line unit. Right. You could go for two and two if you prefer that. I'm just thinking about the way the build out rule works. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, fine. so it might be. And you do have a, a kit for uh, a Centurion 3. You've got a card for. The difference between the 1 and 3 is you've ditched that useless Polston cannon and you've upgraded from the 17 pounder, which <coughs> was in the Firefly, etc., right. to a 20 pounder. Boom. Which I think. Is that the one they called the 77 millimeter? I think they wanted to make a point about it, but there being a new gun. Right. Okay, quick fire, 20 pounder, 84 millimeter gun, it says in this little bit of stuff here. It's an 84 millimeter 84 gun. 84 millimeter gun. Okay, uh, but your anti tank rating goes from 15 to 17, so it's quite a big power up. And your points, uh, I mean, these are, these are difficult to compare to anything, aren't they? But the Centurion 3 are five points a model, roughly, and the Centurion 1 is three and a half points a model, or four for one and seven for two. Nice. There you go, that's the Centurion. Lovely kit. Next up, is that their other one, the Comet? The Comet. Times three, sir. You know when I mentioned 77 mil? It was it's for the this Comet. One. It was for the Comet. Okay, too many tanks, too many tanks. So the, the 77 mil, I think, is actually 76.2 or something like that, or 75. But they wanted everybody to know it was a new gun. Right. So they just So they called it a 77 mil. Yeah. 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 Same but different. Yeah. Um and I think that this was the gun that was supposed to go in Cromwell, but Cromwell's turret couldn't handle it. They basically redesigned Cromwell. But it you see it looks a lot like Cromwell. Yeah, we've yeah. Yeah. The, the kind of whole the, the, Concept of it seems to yeah. be pretty much exactly the same. And the road wheels, it looks a lot like it, but it's been it's got an unusual turret design because the re the reason Cromwell couldn't hold the s this 77 mil gun was because the turret wasn't big enough, and the reason the turret wasn't big enough is because British trains are quite narrow gauge relative to other places, and if the tank doesn't fit on a train, you're never going to get it anywhere. Uh, logistics. Yeah, so Cromwell they couldn't make a turret that fitted it, so this Comet was designed from the ground up to fit this gun in as opposed to like retrofitting the tank to take the better gun yeah it's like we've got a better gun that won't go in any of our in the tank we want it so how do we change you know design a new tank specifically to hold this gun but to have the kind of characteristics of cromwell so you did see this in service in late war it did it's actually not, hit yeah, the, the it, field. Yeah, it did actually oh, hit yeah, the field. Course, yeah, the and did. some of them were still kicking around in Korea and so forth. But Comet was a was a well-loved vehicle. It had the kind of anti-tank performance of the of the American, you know, the 76 mil type gun. Yeah, it was saying some of that. It's like it's, 17 oh, the, pounder. The yeah, have a little look. So yeah, it was saying about the 17 pounder here, but they slightly re-engineered it. Um, yeah. 
to obviously make it fit. Slightly yeah. less powerful than the 17 pounder. Actually. Slightly less powerful, but had a much better HE round, mm. for example, so, which is much more suitable for a medium tank, right, rather than a gun tank. Uh, so that is the comment. What about the kit? Again, I mean, it, lo it looks almost identical to the Cromwell kit. You definitely can tell the difference. The gun looks quite different and the turret is quite different. If you've got these in your collection, um, if you don't know one from the other, look at a photograph and you'll be able to tell. Yeah, that but front you plate is quite yes. significant. Yeah, it it's it's funny that in that ribbed. respect because it... Well, I think it's a canvas bag. Yeah, yeah. I don't know because <laughs> I think we had this conversation we before. Have, definitely. I think that's canvas because if that was metal, that would be a terrible shell trap. <laughs> what? And I, I don't shells. know why it's got something. There must be something to do with the mantle. Maybe water comes in. I don't know maybe, why. Maybe. They, but there is on all the photographs of them. There is this kind of cloth type or tarp or something around the mantle, <laughs> and I don't really understand why. Someone will know. Someone will know, and if you're that person, let us know down in the comments. So that was Comet. Comet. As a kid, Comet Tank was particularly special for me. Why is that? Um, and I hadn't realised that until w until it was mentioned that they were making a Comet Tank. Because my n sort of neighbour's eldest son, who was like four or five years older than me, he had an Airfix kit or some model kit of a Comet. And I remember like reading the leaflet about it. it's like road speed and so, so forth. As like a 10 year your... old boy. I knew nothing about history at that point, but like most sensible boys, I like tanks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this, this older guy who's, you know, his mother was good friends with mine. We spent a lot of time at her house. He built a model, this tank when I was very, very young uh, and, and loved it. Again, like a lot of the newer tanks that they got, the, it builds in the same way. The turret's made in a few different pieces. And like with most of the new ones, they put the joins on the mold on the inside of the turret, of the, of the track. tracks. And that means that you don't have to cut it out. Sometimes when you get them, I mean, these have got very, very thin sprue gates. It's very thin. So which is great. It shows you the kind of confidence. Yeah, yeah, you're not going to do damage. But sometimes if the sprue gates are on the outside of the tracks, you, you might end up cutting into the track pads when you're removing it from the yeah, sprue. Yeah, so easy to do. Um, I, um, yeah, or when you, you can't easily clean it up mm. because the track pads are so small <laughs> and the track markers. You end up cutting the, the tracks You off. end up cutting the, tra the definition of the tracks off. So you get three of them in there. In game, it's got 40 in anti tank power, and in game, they're eight points for three, so they're pretty cheap. Um, but I guess that they've only got a front armor of seven, and things that we've seen have got anti tank power of 15 plus, so <laughs> it All right. can't no, take a hit. Cheap, but you know. You know, actually, how did that compare with Centurion? Centurion has got 10 front armor. So, not huge. Remember, you're still basically playing frames once you get that number plus a D6. Yeah, yeah. So, you've got a chance. Uh, and then the last one is the and special one. And this is one. very special, right? It's the Absolutely. tortoise. The tortoise. The tortoise. A39 tortoise. Oh. So, what do you know about the tortoise, John? Um, I only know little bits. Like, there weren't many actually built. Six, I think. Six. I, I actually, before... Making this video, I cheated. I went. We had to. We had David Willey at the Tank <laughs> Museum done a five-minute video on Tortoise. That's all I took away from it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, what his name was the David six. Willey. No, not even that. Oh, me, you, you missed the trick there. Yeah, uh, yeah David is, is a tank legend. Works at the Tank Museum. Tortoise. They built six of them. It was designed as a assault vehicle because they were worried about the sea freight line. What? Busting through that. Yeah, yeah. So the Siege Free Line is the Westwall. It's this line of German defences on the French border mm. from 1939. Which was completely untouched. Which they didn't use. They didn't, they need didn't to, need to. Because they didn't go that way and the French didn't really attack. So it's still in good nick, as it were, good condition. Our concern was we were going to go up against these First World War style fortifications running from Holland and Belgium to the Swiss border, concrete emplacements, machine gun nests, fortifications, yeah. First World War style things. Like, how are we going to get through that? 
why don't we make a massive bunker busting tank? And it does look mighty, this beast. So it's got about eight inches of front armor. No, okay. Four. Or was it four? So yeah, we, we had to just double check. I remember it, it, it's got eight inches. It's cast like a single piece cast front to it. Um, not the whole of the upper hull, but um, and you'll see if you see a photograph of one, and we got, Mike, Wally Mike's got some, gonna send us one from the tank museum. You can see the point in the side of the, of the front where it's cast from oh, wow. as a single piece. It must weigh 50 tons. That piece of just steel, that alone. eight inches thick, yeah. I mean, I imagine <laughs> the rest of it is barely armoured. But saying that, even the skirts on it look like they're an inch thick. But they're, but they're probably not face hardened and stuff like that. So, so it's got, and in game, it's got a 20 front armour, by the way, our 21. 21. Was it that we had? Yeah. Um, Side rear, 11. <laughs> yeah, so still a lot then. It's still more still than a lot. nothing. 21 versus 11. Yeah, and it's got a what? What was the gun size? 32 pounder. 32 pounder. 32 pounder. 32 pounder. 32 pounder. 32 pounder. Um, that, is the, that is the weight of the burst, bursting charge. Wow. In, you know, in a gun, which is why the two pounder is still a, a meaningful anti-tank weapon in the early war. It's got two pounds, the equivalent of two pounds of high explosive or two pounds of TNT. That's, the, that's where they get these numbers from. It's not that it weighs two pounds. Yeah, it's... it's that if you made it out of TNT or whatever, this that's how much weight of it you would need to get this explosive force. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because the shell probably weighed a great deal more than 32 pounds. Um, it's two-part ammunition, which is why there's something like seven or eight guys in this thing. Mm. It's really quite roomy inside. But the Yeah, he did say that. That was quite yeah. one of the things he did say about yeah. you can have a party inside. Yeah. Relative to other tanks. It's not like you're in a seat <laughs> and that, that's all the space there is, like in a lot of tanks. And you need to be less than five foot six to get in, <laughs> yep. like some Soviet tanks. And um, it's quite roomy in there. Um but two part ammunition because of the because of the size of the shell. Which is why you've got two loaders. Just to speed that process up. But the gun itself is on a gimbal. Yeah, it had a lot of is it, rotation. It had a counterweight, so it's actually very accurate. And it's a, a and it's a gun that's built, you know, it's like the 17 pound is good, but we want to make a better one. And that's what this is. It's still got a 600 horsepower Rolls Royce Meteor. C12 in there. Yeah. And so I it could think spin. it weighed something like 80 tons. 80 tons. It yeah. is just obscene. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's total beastie. weight. But... It's purpose though. So they built six of them. They got six of them working. Mm. It's incredibly effective, the gun on it. it actually, it's, it's road speed wasn't terrible. It's cross country performance is pretty lamentable, so apparently. Um, so why was it never used? Why was it never used? Yeah. I think the war ended before uh, it was actually used, no? The war didn't end before we went through the siege free line. <laughs> no, but we didn't get them out there, right? No, because the sea free line wasn't what we thought it was. This, these 1939 static German defences, we were terrified. Well, not terrified is probably a big word, but we concerned. were quite... We were, <laughs> yeah, we were quite deeply concerned that we would end up in this grinding attritional battle right. on the old Franco-German border. What we didn't know at the time, which we know now, is they'd taken most of the weapons out of it to put the Atlantic Wall. So they just the Atlantic Wall was built out of the the West the German Westwall, the old Czech defences on the Sudeten border, and the French Maginot Line. All the weapons and so forth, well not all, but most of, had been repurposed into the Atlantic Wall. Because we think about D Day and a handful of bunkers, mm. but the Atlantic Wall went from the Spanish border to the Arctic Circle. It's quite a stretch. So. It's quite a lot of space to cover. Yeah. Now, it wasn't all as well defended as the Pas de Calais. They, you know, they expected a landing somewhere in that area. So the actual siege free line was a lot of empty concrete emplacements against a deeply demoralised <laughs> German army. So it just turned out not to be wow. what we thought it might have been. But this was people in early 44 saying, do you know what, when We're we get there, get they put a defence up there. We're going to get stuck there for potentially four years, like in the First World War. It's no good. You know, it's like, we don't want that. No good. We don't want that to happen. So they built this tank. Now, as a kit, this is a remarkably small number of pieces. 
It is in the style the way they do a lot of their infantry fighting vehicles. Mm. So in most of their tanks, you have a lower hull and an upper hull, and then you stick the tracks on. Whereas their APCs, you tend to have a top surface, a bottom surface, and you plug the sides in. Yep. And I think it's to do with height to, to width type ratios, because this is a very tall vehicle. It has got pretty high sides. It's pretty high sided. Um, and the way that injection molding works, that means I think that they can't mold the sides well onto the upper hull. So they've molded them that as a separate, separate piece. section. Yeah, because a lot of modern APCs are actually higher than World War II tanks, because mm. they've got guys in them. But, so you, you put your two pieces together, you put your sides on. Yep. My experience of that type of build is 95% okay. Every now and then you get one that it hasn't quite fit well. And maybe that's because I've not properly sanded all the edges okay. or something. And you absolutely need to peg it while it dries and things like that. You sometimes have to grip them because you've got a lot of exposed joins. Well, you know, when the entire upper hull is molded as one piece, you could have some quite dodgy glue connections underneath that you wouldn't see. But when they're on the seam lines the sides, at, yeah, at the yeah. side, a lot of little angles it's well. got to be perfect. Yeah. Now, my experience with them is that 99% of them fit perfectly. Okay. But if your plate starts to lean off during the drying process or whatever, so you probably want to rubber band these, mm. put the gun in, last of all, yeah, because the gun just plugs into the front look. Yep. You don't, it, you don't have to mount Bloop. it and poke it through from, from inside. So, yeah, remarkably small number of pieces. Really like this vehicle. And it's... A real, if you if you're sort of a friend of the tank museum, if you've been there, it's a really iconic piece there because it's massive, and it's World War Two, and it's it's that kind of Hobart's funny type quirky. It's like you Weird actually built some thing, of these and yeah. never used them. And yeah, we never really stopped like trying other things. You've got to keep trying. You never know. But there was no way that this thing was going to drive to Berlin. You know, it was built for a job that turned out not to be needed, not be necessary. Negative. However, airdrop it in. If you play in a science fiction fantasy type game, right. such as this Go is, for it. there's no reason we couldn't have mass produced these. The reason we didn't was we didn't need them. But if we were fighting thousands of IS threes, then maybe we'd go like, I think we need some of them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Boom. So they're the British ones. What do you think, John? Do you feel confident about fielding a British force in uh, Clash of Steel? When you say confident, <laughs> <laughs> do you mean on the tabletop or do you mean me actually constructing hey, the force? Are you more games than you lose, I think, John? You just like playing the, yeah. you, you know. Play the fool. Yeah. Play the fool. Play the fool. Play the fool. So let's have a look at the Germans then. Mm, and, and start with the mouse. We'll start with the mouse. You've got well, two, right? I think so. If you're going to play a fantasy or uh, science fiction type, what if alternative history at the end of the Second World War, then you really need to start by assuming the mass producing mouse because it's clearly a great idea. Oh, definitely. This is the tank that would have won the war if only it could drive more than 20 yards without getting stuck. They really yeah. did make what? At least one, I think maybe two. They tried to send one into battle. I think it got stuck after a few hundred yards. But <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> It's here. Mouse in the game has got a front armor of 20. It's got the 12.8 centimeter KWK 44 gun, which has got an anti-tank rating of 18. Interesting. And that means Can it, even it cannot penetrate tortoise. It can, cannot can penetrate. tortoise get through? Uh, Tortoise has got an anti-tank rating of 18, so Tortoise can't get through Mouse, and Mouse, mouse can't, can't get through Tortoise. What? There you go, that is what happens when you put like 200 mil of steel, hardened steel pretty, pretty armor. Pretty survivable. Yeah. Um, it gets a tactical move of 8 inches, which I think is extremely generous. It's very generous. Not 1 inch, but it's got to be playable. It's got to be playable. Well, um, and this kind of setting is a few years after the war. Then maybe they found a better they've engine, enhanced, and and, and they've got ac and they've got access to Western materials. So all of like Ferdinand Porsche's crazy ideas about things that need to be made out of tungsten and chromium and all these things that, that Germany didn't have during the loads war. Suddenly, 
Uncle Joe can, uh, not Uncle Joe, Uncle <laughs> Sam can provide all of that, right? Joe's the other dude. Uncle yeah. Joe's the other guy, the one with the moustache. Mm. <laughs> right. Uh, Mouse. So Mouse came out with World of Tanks, the miniatures game. Yes. It is a beast of a tank. It is a mighty tank. I think it's interesting to put it alongside Centurion. So you can grasp. This is what Germany felt the future of tanks was going to be. And this is what the future of tanks actually was. The main battle tank, the super heavy, doesn't work battle well, tank. Well, it, you know, it's a 50-50. 50-50, So <laughs> which way it was going to go. But, the, but in a game like this, you definitely, if you're playing Germans, you want to be playing with mouse. Mm. As a kit, it's... It's not many parts. They really. use the same design features that they use with their other tanks. It's just a much bigger kit. So th this is much more like a twenty mil tank mm. in terms of overall size. In fact, some of the bigger twenty mil tanks are smaller than this. But it's using the same s sort of design cues. So you've only got what twenty twenty principal pieces, if that, if that. So again, because it's very high sided, yet it's having to do. Um, it, you're having to, rather than just gluing the whole of the upper hull to uh, like a canoe shape, like most of their tank designs, you're having to put the sides on. So again, like I said, make sure that everything is in line and it's held in place. Maybe wrap some rubber bands around while it dries, because if a gap appears there, you're kind of stuck with it. Yep. Um, you don't have to put the tracks all the way around. So it does have separate tracks from running gear, but you see, look, the track, it, it, it's just a straight piece with a, with a slight tilt. Same with the mouse. Because yeah. it, so it's it just the disappears of, under the skirts, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And it's got loads of teeth to line it up with the wheels. Loads of teeth. Which is great. Well, the wheels are tiny. Tiny little the mouse wheels. On mouse, uh, they are tiny, the road wheels on mouse. I'm not sure what that's about in terms of... Um, when you use big wheels and when you yeah, use small wheels more, in tank more, designs. More contact onto the track, maybe? Uh, uh, yeah, I wonder if it's got more to do with the suspension, oh. that it's much more dispersed. The bigger the wheel, the more load each individual kind of suspension point yeah, so is. So lots of little ones. Lots of little ones where it spreads the load. Because I know certainly Mouse is built with serious material shortages. Mm. Not a lack of steel, but a, lo a lack of the things you need to make these sophisticated alloys that are just stronger than steel. And they're just not available. And they're just not available Sorry. in Germany. And this is this is huge for a post-war tank, which Chieftain absolutely is. This thing is way yeah. bigger. Did um, not go that way, did it? But a, but a lovely kit. And you get to, you've got one, so that is going to be your headquarters. And you can fire at Tortoise all day long yep. and do no damage to one Sit another. There and not worry about the thing. Yeah, there you go. That is Mouse. The Mouse. The Mouse. Uh, Shall we step down? Step down. Shall we do... The Koenig's Tiger, yeah. the King Tiger, the Royal Tiger, the Tiger 2. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, um, built a couple of these for my late war, super late war Germans. The, as rare a sight as a, as a Royal Tiger is, a King Tiger, they are the new breakthrough tank in 1944. They are what is being built. This is the one. This is the one, yeah. Absolutely. So Kit saying uh, similar design features to their normal tanks in that you have this kind of canoe body with the keys, mm, keying bunch, points, bunch the whole upper hull is a single surface, plop it on. It's a lovely, simple, easy kit to make. And then you've got things like your exhaust you glue on separately. But again, they're keyed as a single piece, so you're not fiddling with each exhaust. Yeah, no, I'm they're, grateful they, for that. They make really good kits in that respect. Some model makers would complain about the fidelity, but it's a 15 mil tank, not a 54 mil tank. It's a and it's for piece. war gamers. Yeah. So I like to see that the exhausts are on there, but I don't want to individually place them. Mm. You know, yeah. so there's a single piece for the twin exhaust and other parts of the apparatus Fair external compromise. to the tank. Yeah, absolutely. So Tiger 2, um, front armor 16, anti-tank power 17. So again, it's it's kind of a problem dealing with itself. Yeah, it's still, yeah, yeah, packing a punch. Can anything hurt anything in this game? <laughs> Uh, well, well the, yeah, the 32 pounder could definitely hurt Tiger 2. Yes, it's um, it's got the world. 18. Yeah, so Tortoise versus the world. <laughs> well, I think you're going to find as points values are still such that you haven't got an entire force of King Tigers. 
Remember, you've got to claim those objectives on the yeah, board. That's, the that's very that's different the from from very Flames of War. You've got to get there, have the things, and and uh, certainly it's the case in, in Flames of War. Is what happens if you spend all of your points on the massive, very powerful vehicles? You can be all but indestructible. You know, you had Soviet KV twos in the mid war. Yeah, they're nearly indestructible. IS two in the late war. Pretty, pretty solid old, you know, King Tigers in the late war, very hard to kill. But if you've got to zip around the board claiming objectives that are, ch that are dynamically changing during a game, you're not putting out enough shots. No, no. That's so the real life I'll say. It's not just the claiming the objectives, it's the putting out the shots to kill enough yeah. of the other guy's models. Yeah. Um, and that's that, that, that's that the balance. balance, that's that trade off. Absolutely. Yeah. And there we go. Now, this is the one that confuses me the most. Why is the tiger in there? Why is the tiger in there? Why is the tiger in there? About a thousand tigers are made. Something of that order, I think. I can't remember the exact numbers, and I, I could be wrong in saying that, but it's not large numbers. Tiger production is completely stopped in 1944. Because they start the making one. King Tiger. Mm. Zero tigers are made after they begin production, mainland production of King Tiger. Oh. Now well, there still, still are a lot of the there's still a lot of King Ti um, there are a lot of tigers kicking Towards around in forty four because mm. they're the ones that were built in forty three and shipped out certainly on the Western Front where they weren't fighting. Tigers allocated to so the Western Front in forty three are still there. And there's still a lot of them around relative to numbers produced because it's quite a survivable vehicle. But they're not building any new ones. And I don't know that they would have restarted it. Maybe. Restarted production. Maybe because they're just they moved over to these this. are the survivors of, you know. They, they're, right. They're, they're. But it's also, it's a, because we it's think iconic. a Tiger is a late war vehicle, but it's not. 42? Tigers, like yeah. Tiger's a mid-war vehicle. July 42. Uh, this is my knowledge of the yeah, <laughs> It was yeah, written here. It is here, what's so, written yeah. there. So like Tiger is, 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 a, is a very powerful mid-war vehicle, mm. but it is not a very powerful late-war vehicle. We have this we have this very Western skew on this. And again, it's things we talked about. We talked about this over and over. Yes. Um, is we fixate on the medium tank doctrine. We fixate on Sherman. We fixate on mass production. Mm. And what we know is Sherman cannot be Panther or Tiger. But there will be Shermans, and there will not be Panthers or Tigers in most battlefield spaces. And that's a choice that we make. Lots and lots of tanks. <laughs> lots and lots of tanks. Anybody that needs a tank is going to get a tank. And, the, and, and partly it's a logistics thing as well. It's not just a production thing, but serial production has huge benefits in terms of quantity. Mm. The number of Shermans that can be built, because we're not tinkering with the design, what changes is just do this, guys, get, get the guys and, and women that are making them just get better and better and better and better and better at it, right? Yeah. They get faster, 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 faster. And instead of learning how to make changes to the vehicle, they're learning how to make changes to the process to speed the process up. Yeah, efficiency. So it becomes much more efficient over time. Hmm. But it's also got to be shipped. So if you make a tank that's 50% bigger or 50% more powerful than Sherman, it takes up more than 50% more space on a Liberty ship. And these things are coming from Detroit and California yeah. to, you want to, try and maximize. <laughs> to Paris. Yeah. You know, so the logistics of shipping them around is quite important. But on the Eastern Front, which is one of the things I don't understand about the Bulge. Mm. And the Bulge, the Germans pull all these King Tigers in against an army that is equipped with, Panth with Shermans. They don't need tanks that big. Why did they do that? Well, they were the new breakthrough tanks oh, that they so were making. Just, right, let's get them into Yeah, but Panther and Tiger were already pretty indestructible <laughs> to, to, to Western allies. Yes, yeah, yeah. so they really didn't need they didn't need that. But on the other front, things are very different. On the Soviet front, the Soviets do have a heavy tank doctrine. Although they stopped making KV ones to a large extent, that isn't because they don't want a heavy tank. It's because a KV one has got the same gun that a T thirty four has got. A KV-1 is a heavy tank with a medium tank gun. Because the medium tanks go up in right. in gunpowder and they match the older pattern. If I'm making sense? I think so. Yeah. 
but you're starting to get stuff like the ISUs and the, and the Stalin tanks appearing on the Eastern Front, 44. Big boys. The Germans need the big, powerful vehicles. Yeah, so there is there is a real need for that. And I think no amount of Panzer IVs were ever going to be good enough for that game. Mm. You know? So, um, so the idea that the Germans need to keep scaling up their tanks, we tend to th we we see it often in the West through the lens of the Western experience as a a prohibitively expensive, you know, fantasy. Mm. Because we won the war, and therefore the way that we did it must have been the right way of doing it. it must have been, yeah. Right, we won. But we weren't fighting the Soviets. No. <laughs> so we have no we have no real you know, way to comment on uh, on how true that is. Not until Clash of Steel. Not until Clash point. of Steel, when everybody's fighting <laughs> the Soviets. Everyone's fighting the Soviets. Yeah. Um, so there you go. So uh, Tiger as a kit is another one of these. Um, it's one of their earlier kits, actually. I was about Can to say, you read the quite, date on it? Because your, eyes, your young so, eyes. Surprisingly, it's 2016. 2016. Did so they upgrade eight, it? Eight, eight, eight year old kit. Uh, no, it's, a, it's a funny one because it's been designed in three parts. Um, so the mold's obviously got some kind of uh, cut-off points. You see, there's connectors here, mm. but they're not they're not cut. They're they're clean. So the mold probably just has a slide in it. So there's a common section, and then an early and a late right. section is the, yep. is is the way that it works. Um, if you've seen both versions, the early and the late, and the earlier one has got things like the desert filters on it, and the later ones has got like Zimmerit skirts. This is one of their sense. more complicated kits to build. It's not hugely complicated. It's still got the wheels and the running gear and a single key piece. It's still got the lower hull um, that you attach them to. But there's just more pieces overall. Yeah, so the, bo the boxy nature of it, which is kind of raised above the lower hull, you're going to build up the side and rear panel and front and rear panels from this lower hull. The top piece is keyed a number of points, so it is all going to slide. But it's another one probably better not to use super glue. You'd be much better off using a plastic glue and then making sure because you've got a little bit of give in case something's a little bit out of yeah, place. Yeah, you can wiggle it about. And then once you've definitely got all the pieces in the right place, then get a rubber band around it or just hold it for 15 minutes, something like that, to make sure none of it sort of peels away. I'm talking about. Like these are really niche issues, and it doesn't happen very often. But I built so many flames at one time. You've come across. It is it is something that can happen, mm. and the last place in the world you want a gap on a, on a tank is appearing in the upper deck in surfaces if the side is coming away from the top. Yeah, it's not so good. And it doesn't it doesn't look good, and it's very fixable by using. Um, plastic glue and a rubber band if it's if to prevent if it necessary. from happening. So the last one, last the Panzer four seventy or the Panzer four L seventy. Mm -hmm. So this is a Jag Panzer. This is a Panzer four hull. Right. Yep. Yep. It's got we the talk, Stug. We've talked about this one before. It's not a Stug. No, the predecessor was. Right. So Stamgeschut Stug. The thing that you would normally call a Stug. Mm. Is a Stug three. It's a built off the. It's built on a Panzer three, three. chassis, this which is, is why in, from 1943 they completely stopped building Panzer threes altogether. All of the Panzer three manufacturing facilities make Stug instead. They did make a handful of Stug four. They had a look at building them, um, but I think at that point they don't have a gun oh. that's significantly better. So why, why are you stopping building Panzer IV to make a self-propelled gun that's no better than the one we're making on the Panzer III chassis? Less gubbins, mate. Less gubbins. Well, this Let's is slightly, slightly bigger than Panzer IV. Well, yeah, true. Um, so the Panzer IV L70 comes in quite late. It's another one of these like, oh, we can't afford to build tanks. We could build more tank destroyers if only we had, you know enough guns for them. Right. So this Panzer IV L70 is a Stemgeschutz type vehicle built on a Panzer IV hull. It's not a Stug design. I'm not quite sure why they call it the 4L70. The L70 bit is the is about the gun. You see these numbers on German vehicles, the the KWKL something. Mm. The L something is the is the length in relation to the bore. 
So it's not that it is 70 whatever's long, it's that it's 70 times as long as it is wide. Okay. Which is, a, which is then about rifling and, and high velocity, right? So that's what that L number is. So the 75 mil KWKL24 is a very short barrel 75 mil gun. That's the early war howitzer. As the L70 is a very long barreled one and is therefore much higher velocity because the pressure is behind the round for so much longer. Mm. You understand? So like, you know, the, 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 the ignition, the firing, it pushes it forwards. As soon as it exits the barrel, the gases are all dispersed. The longer it's in the barrel, the more time it's accelerating for and, and the more time it's got engaging with the rifling mm. in the barrel which is what keeps it accurate by exerting that spin True so, it's that, it, so it's that pressure longer barrel equals more accurate and higher speed most of the time <laughs> so this is the late war design there there are large numbers but not huge numbers of them um but they're still making panzer fours and i think the panzer 4 l70 it isn't quite what they need it to be because by this point they've found Hetzer. And Hetzer is tiny. <laughs> Hetzer is on that, that late 1930s uh, Czech hull, the 38T. And so it, its weight, its size, it's tiny. It's quite cramped and low tech yeah, in but... that respect. But that's what they want their ambush vehicles to be. Cheap, small easily produced that's exactly what it's going to be so this kind of sits in an odd place it's uh, the higher performance gun is definitely better than the gun on the Hetzer, but it's still not it's still not fantastic in terms of dealing with the the big soviet tanks or whatever mm. it's not going to do the job you're still going to need something better um so it's it's more another one of those stopgap ones it is an interesting kit though because it's one of the newer ones so the date on this, John, is... It's a very good question. It's uh, 2020, so yeah. 2020. I think this is one of the kind of COVID kits, so it came out later yeah. than yeah. expected with the last, or oh, one of the later late war German army boxes mm. and army deals. And a lot of people wanted this. Um, so it's built in the same in the same kind of way. You've got your tracks and your running gear, keyed, what different number of keying points on each side, your lower hull piece to which you attach your upper hull, and you're mostly done. Plate at the back, fine. It does, however, have these strange kind of plates that give it a silhouette at the back. And they're funny pieces. Can you see these? Oh, uh, these sort of flares. The, yeah, yeah. So they... It's because of the way that the, the back deck is shaped. It has these kind really of flat, angled just, yeah, pieces angle. and they fit an, to the hull at a slight curve, at a slight angle. I think I mentioned to this, like when we originally reviewed this, I built one of these expecting those pieces to be very difficult. They're almost like cheeks to the back of the deck. Yeah. Little... Yeah. And I'm not really sure what purpose they do. I mean, maybe on the actual tank rather than on the model, that is the shape of the hull. But because it's a model, you see... tend to think of these things as being like applique, as being yeah, extra. Why? Yeah. Um, I think the, why they've done it is to get that shape. Because if you see where it keys in, look, John, there's, this is curved. It's quite an odd, quite an odd shape. That looks fiddly to me. Right. And I thought it was going to be a nightmare, but actually it's exactly the right shape and it's keyed in all the right in places such a way here. That it just slots on. And it and it not just that it slots in, is it kind of grips in the place that it wants to be. It wants to stay when you've got it, you know, as, as you as you're putting the piece on. You got your glue on the back of it, you got to stick the piece on, and it and it wants to be in the where shape it needs that, where be. it needs to be. Okay, well that's yeah. good design. Whenever you've got to glue something at an angle, you're thinking, oh, this isn't yeah, going to work. Yeah, it's going to go everywhere. Yeah, it's going to be glue everywhere, and one of them's going to be like on a shallower angle than <laughs> the other. But right yeah, the the the, there's multiple keying and, and kind of gripping points on this that are all quite small, both on the cheek pieces themselves. Mm. Plus the under yeah. side of that. Yeah, plus, it's, it's it, plus the upper deck. It's a very clever piece of engineering to get an awkward shape. Mm. I was really impressed with that. Um, and it's also got there's, there's a couple of spare wheels on the back. 
And so you, to make it less fiddly, they just stuck them both together and you just oh, plug, yeah, them plug them in. Yeah, you've got these kind of, these look like strange holes on the on the uh, rear deck, but they're not. They're just keying points the for the spare are. wheels. Yeah. That's good. And again, so they go on, they go on nice and easy. It's, um, it's one of their later kits, like some of the other things we've seen. But because it's a smaller kit, it doesn't have to make some of the more difficult design choices they made with these bigger ones. It's like a, a very good version of the way they normally do things, mm. you know, in, in sort of more sophisticated. Clever boys. Really quite impressed. And girls, of course. And um, look, I, I, I feel as a game, I think, I think there's a lot going for it. I think as a star set in particular, you, when you go away from this, the fact that they've even given you unit cards for stuff that you well, don't have. Well, for the have, whole army list yeah. that you get. Yeah, and a mini codex. Yeah. And I assume that for the meantime, that that's pretty much what it is. That they're, they're the vehicles that there are. Now, we do know that there's some stuff scheduled to come out for a World of Tanks, which would fit in with this. There are mouse variants. All the, yeah, the big and, guys. And others. And presumably, if they get to bring those into this game, which I think they will, yeah, well, surely. A, when you buy the platoon box, it'll probably come with the right card. Um, but B, maybe at that point, there will be a fuller codex and there will be a way of developing the game to be a little mm. bit more serious for those that want that. Yeah. But as an out-of-the-box gaming experience, I think this is great. I mean, I've I've got all of the German vehicles here and most of the British vehicles. Straight There's just a the higher tabletop. preponderance of... There's obviously more stuff that the British built in the 1950s than the Germans did. Yeah. Um, because factually, yeah. Cause it kind factually, of <laughs> because they still had a military industry yeah. uh, in that period. I'm pretty sure it's £60, but if it's not, we'll put up on the screen the uh, when we we'll double-check the price of that. For a £60 game, a lot of plastic, 17 Lots pounds. of plastic. All the bits that you're going to need. Loads of replayability. I think if you're attracted to this set, you're going to like it. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you're still here and you're looking for ways to support the channel, there's obviously a lot of ways down in the description, but a key way is to use our affiliate links to Whaling Games and others. You buy your models from them, it doesn't cost you a penny more, and we earn a little bit of commission. Thank you. Thank you.